Hi, Sam. How are you, Jason? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you for uh, being our very first virtual artist talk. Well, who better than me to be virtual, I guess. <laughs> right. Good to be here. Right. So, um, obviously, we're here doing it this way because of because of the time we're in. And I think that that um, is highlighted in the title of your show here, yeah. our, which we can see in my background. Um, mm -hmm. So the title of your exhibition here is, is New Work in the Time of COVID-19, wait, Art in the Time of COVID-19 New, New Works by Sam Rosemary. So um, you uh, you got a good little play there with the with the condition right now. It is true. I'm happy to see you stumble over the title. I thought you were going to ask me to remember, and it would never happen. But it is true. I think it's because this basically this whole body of work was completed. I would say in the time of COVID, in mostly the big shutdown. You know, I started it in March, a few were earlier in January, but mostly from March through end of August, you know? And the 19 in it, obviously COVID-19, gave me a goal of 19 pieces to complete, so. And we have 19, 19 successful pieces in the gallery. Well, I hope so. That's cool. So you, uh, your first year of retirement from Harper has been an interesting, uh, solitary time. <laughs> yeah, I had absolutely no idea that when I quit Harper, I would go into quarantine and solitude. Um, it has been interesting. And I have to say that one of the wonderful things about making art is even in these times, they can't take that away from you. You can still make art. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go back to the beginning for a minute. And... So I'm curious, I think everybody would want to know how you got into art and why you chose ceramics. Yeah, I, I got into art in 1970. I was a lost and confused undergrad at Northern Illinois University, anniversary, university anniversary, <laughs> trying to figure out who I was and just kind of grazing for classes. And back then, this is surprise people to get a class. You actually had to go in person and pull a card to, to do that. And the ceramics program was recruiting and they had a student on a potter's wheel throwing as entertainment. And I had never seen that before. And I was fascinated. And I said, I'm going to take this class. And I took it. I, have to own up to loving it from the very beginning. But as much about the people in the community at that time mm -hmm. as the material. And I love the material. It seemed like the perfect material for me to work with. It was subtractive. It was additive. I could do what I wanted with it. Um, it was just technical enough for me to enjoy the process and, and experiment. So it was a, a perfect fit. So then you, that stayed, great. you stayed at Northern for your master's, right? I did because I only had two years in the program and I really felt like I had not learned enough. And I wasn't sure where I wanted to go on with. And I felt if I left Northern, I might not come back to, to college. And they offered me an assistantship, a graduate assistantship which was a wonderful thing back there. You know, it was $153 a month <laughs> and free to And I could actually live on that. Shocking. And it was, um, it was a perfect fit for me. At that point, I wanted to be a functional potter. You know, it was kind of the, the concept of 50 acres in a, a kiln. And I just wanted to make work. So then after grad school, did you go right into becoming a full-time artist or did you start teaching right away? Well, I actually started adjuncting right away because one of the, my fellow graduate students 
came up to me and said, how would you like a job teaching at Sauk Valley College in Dixon, Illinois? And I go, what do you mean? I don't even have my master's yet. He goes, I know, but I got a full-time job, but I signed the contract. And if I find someone, I can go take the full-time gig. So I took his job and went out there. And it was not my intention to teach, honestly. I really wanted to be a maker. And I got there and found I really loved it. You know, that interaction with students, teaching something you love to do. So that's how I got started. And I was doing at the same time local art fairs, trying to eke out a living. So for that, for that first number of years, then, was it kind of a balance between part-time teaching and making and showing? It was. It was. I, I would say easily for the first five years, I um, did this split between adjunct and doing the shows. And then at the end of that period, I kind of felt I had to change. I wanted to see, could I earn a living off of my work? And so I did a number of years as full-time studio artist and traveled around the country did art fairs, and um, pursued a life in clay. And then when did you end up at Harper? Well, you know, I had done that for a number of years. To be honest, art is one of those things that's driven by the economy. The economy kind of bottomed out. At the same time, Mike Brown, who was then department chair at Harper, called me and said, how would you like to come teach here? And I went, wow, this is good timing. And I came to Harper. And that would have been, hmm, I don't even know when in the 80s, to be honest. You know, but it was a really good fit. I came as an adjunct faculty member. He told me at the time there would be a new art building built. And maybe at the end of the rainbow, there'd be a full-time job. Honestly, I didn't believe him, but I needed the work. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I started teaching at Harper. And as you know, there is a new building. It's a beauty. Um, and 28 years later, I left it. During that time, what you know, whether it was the, the time of your doing the art fairs full time or your early days of teaching, what was your work like? Well, that's that's. I started out as a functional potter. I loved it. Um, I was sworn to throwing at the wheel. It was a process I really loved and wanted to master. And I did that. But then I found that, you know, that part where you're earning a living is a little like being a one person factory. And I was constantly in motion, making, glazing, firing, selling. And I began to lose that feeling of what I was doing. So I would start to take a week, a month, and just make these pieces I enjoyed. And I think that is what pushed me more towards sculptural work. And as people looked at it and said, you know, this is really good, this is really unique, I started to do it more. And of course, I discovered I couldn't sell it, and people still wanted to buy the functional work. But then I got fortunate and I got the adjunct teaching part of it at that time. And that sort of paved the way that I did not have to earn my living solely at the art fairs. And I could um, make what I wanted to make and see what happened. So then there was a long time of, of a balance between functional work and sculptural work. There was, there was, because, you know, I'm still, I still like to sit down and make functional work. There's something about the, the pure joy of making it. And, you know, it sounds ridiculous when you say it, but eating off of or drinking out of something you've made is a very special feeling, mm -hmm. you know, for me. Um, otherwise, we'd be a paper plate society, and I certainly don't want to be part of that. So there is something about the the beauty and the functionality of something that's handmade. So as your, as your work shifted from functional to sculptural, even if it was kind of a, a blend at that time, did that change 
the um, the ways you were showing it or the opportunities you had to exhibit your work? I mean, obviously, like you said, it changed your sales, right? Because right. the functional work sells better. Um, but what about showing it? How did that change? Well, you know, showing it, I, I could get it into galleries now. You know, functional wear was, you know, and, and people throw the word craft out there like it's a bad thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. You know, quality craft. And I could sell that at the art fairs, and that was great. The sculptural stuff was a little slower, but I couldn't get the craft goods into too many galleries, but I could get the sculptural work into galleries. So that was kind of a rewarding feeling to see your work in a setting not terribly unlike it is right now at Harper. It's that um, when I went back the second time to teaching, you know, adjuncting and doing that, the adjuncting actually afforded me the time to do more sculptural work. And at least for me, the more I did it, the more I could develop it, the more I could get it into galleries, the better it was. It also, when I became full-time, I really did not have the time to do the art fairs the way I used to. So there was no need for me to produce a product solely to sell it, I could earn a living. So it allowed me to make more sculpture and see what was happening. I think that there are still to this day elements of functional work that are in my, my art. So, you know, the stuff on the wall a few years ago would have been plates that probably had the same textures and quality as you see in this show, as opposed to them being rectangles solely based on texture and surface. So it, it's hard to get the functional out of a, a potter. It's always there underlying. I think it's interesting when you, and I've thought this for years, when you talk about art fairs and you, and you have a long history of, of showing and selling in art fairs, I think the term art fair has changed so much in the in you know the past ten years. So you know what you're talking about is this you know this show outside where the artists have their own tent or booth or space, right? Mm -hmm. But but I think now you know for so much of the art world or art students, you know when you hear art fair, you think about. You know, you think about Navy Pier and Art Chicago and Expo yep. and the Armory and Basel and Miami, you know, and this, and it's a very different thing. So there's, but those, but the art fairs you're talking about are still happening, of course. Absolutely. And, and it's an interesting, interesting mix or an interesting um, kind of confusion point that they use that same, the same term, but they're so kind of different. Yeah. It made me laugh for years because if you told an artist, that you do art fairs, they did the usual look down at you. Oh, you do those. Right. Craft. I get it. I get it. Art is based on a certain amount of, um, we'll leave that word out, shall we say. But nonetheless, it's always there. And then when the galleries needed to make money, which is really what it started about, how do I get more people into my gallery? Mm -hmm. They came up with this idea of art fairs, like it was a fresh brand new idea. And it was really a matter of instead of the artist having their own booth, the galleries now did and brought their stable of artists to this to show that off and to expand their um, viewership. So it's kind of interesting now still, you know, with art fairs, there's always been a tiered structure. You know, there are the art fairs I did when I first got out of grad school and they were quite something. It was me on a lawn with a couple of boards and some pots. And then there are the art fairs that are at the next level and the quality of the work gets better. And then there are art fairs that really are rival the galleries version of art fairs. And I think that all of those levels still exist today. I mean, I'm not an expert because I really haven't done the fairs in years. I haven't had to, mm -hmm. but it's kind of interesting how they have developed into doing that. So, yeah, I think that's an interesting change or development in our world. And it's interesting to think about where that'll go to as galleries 
disappear and art fairs take over, but now with COVID, art fairs are impossible. So it's, yeah. like, it's interesting to, to think of. Isn't it a mention of what might be the pop-up shows we begin to see now where artists get together, a few of them, and find a space, a closed-up storefront, and they, they put together a show. Mm -hmm. and so now it, it's kind of the art fair theory, but strictly artists run. Right. And I like that. I, good direction. So let's talk about this show um, for a minute. So this is your new newest body of work, right? And the work in here and um, people watching this can go and see the slideshow and they can see they can see the work in other ways outside of this video, this interview. But the the work in here is is fully sculptural, right? Mm -hmm. um, yet there's a there's a functional element to a number of the pieces, the totems, you know, like you can see behind me here, the, the totems still use stacked vessel forms and the wall pieces mm -hmm. still have a, a platter plate eating surface kind of a feel to a lot of them, but they're clearly not functional. So mm -hmm. um, uh, can you talk about that at all? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, you know, I think, you know, when I was first making that transition from the functional vessel to the more sculptural vessel, I realized that the thing that I always considered is even the functional piece and the sculptural piece, they were like these little sacred objects to me. I liked them. You know, if I made a, something as humble as a cup, there's the shape of the cup and the handle and whatever embellishments you put on in the glaze and how it felt, how you would hold it, you know, it was this thing. And if you look at the totems, um, look, I must have talked for years, I have a prop. But mm -hmm. what I found I like to do with these and how these started is I would make these pieces and they were these wonderful individual sacred objects. And for the first time I went to a lot of what you see in the um, totems are cast pieces. Make the original, make a mold, cast them, repeat them, change them. And when I put them together, it was like the stacking of these sacred objects that became this, oh, I don't know, storytelling thing. But it was your own story. I have no story to tell you with this. I make them and you look at them and they begin to repeat themselves in some of these pieces. And so they're like the totem marker of kind of a time or a place. And so that's what happened with those. The wall pieces, for me, um, honestly, I was tired of throwing. I was tired of such a strong allusion to um, the functional side of it that I started to hand build them. Years ago, I made these puzzle pieces. And if you look at some of these, they still go together. But they're really about, if you see it, they match up surfaces. Um, the textures repeat themselves throughout the show. I think the other thing is that with this body of work and this time you're living in, I could not come to the college. I could not use all the different kilns and processes that were there. I was stuck with the ones I have in my studio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got kilns, I can make the pieces, I can fire. But the pit fire was done in an old Weber kettle in my backyard to my neighbor's chagrin. But I've always liked the fact that you make this piece and you use a primitive process like pit fire, or I did Raku for years. And I had only so much control. Some of it was up to the kiln to do it. It was kind of like the magic that transforms. So that's a little bit about what this show is. Yeah, I think that the, the wall pieces, um, they have a really strong drawing quality to them. Mm -hmm. the, I think between the way that you've, you know, they've got multiple layers of things that you've done to them, right? They've, I mean, they're constructed and then they're, they're stamped and they're pressed and they're formed dimensionally. 
And then in the firing process, you've got the, you know, the control of, of the different materials you use to create the smoke patterns and the markings that way. And then there's paint in some of them with the, with the metallic paint. So the, so they're really, you know, the, the base form hasn't, it becomes almost like a drawing surface, right? Or like a panel for a painting, and you've done all these things on it that are that are really more compositional. Yep, yep. I think that this is probably the strongest design body of work that I've done. You know, on a number of levels. First of all, I I, I limited myself to nineteen pieces, for which of course I made more. But mm -hmm. it was really about finding this continuity in the work and doing it. And I never really thought that they really are like panels or pieces of paper that I could draw on. And the funny thing is, and I can't find them right now in my studio, but some of my friends have commented, we didn't know you drew. And I would do these little drawings, these pieces, because I was interested in how did I see them going together and how would I change the surfaces and what is the proportion changes and how would they fit into my smaller urban kilns. So those were all considerations. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that drawing in an assembly sort of way, right, mm -hmm. with all those different layers of process. And then the totems, right, we can see behind me, we can see behind you as well. Yeah. The totems, you know, like you held up that little piece and they almost feel like you, you know, you just make endless numbers of these pieces and then collect them up, right? And they're interchangeable and they're modular and they're just, they're, rather than being um, fully uh, thought through or formulated or designed totem structures, they, they're, they're more like collections of individual parts. Because if you were to come into my studio before I started to do the totem assembly, every surface was covered with individual pieces. And now it came down to the designing part of putting them together in the way you want it. And at first they were very square, if you will, straight up, straight down. If you look at some of them, even the one over your right shoulder, it juts out in different places. And I like that. I like the tension that was created when they were loosely balanced, if you will. So I kind of like that. Um, uh, I should give a shout out. Honestly, you'll see a number of bird heads used in these. And they come from one of my favorite people, and I know one of yours, Dan Lane. And Dan was uh, a faculty member at the Art Institute for years, and then he came to Harper and worked. And he was a joy to watch work, and he would find stuff and do stuff, you know, and he made the, the bird heads. And I, I, was, I received one and had a mold. Made And I kind of repeat it because I think of it as this perfect topping. I love thinking in a way, you know, I'm collaborating with Dan on these things. Mm -hmm. And years ago, you and I did a project at Harper where we built totems. A whole right. project was very involved, but it was the same thing. It was gigantic. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody made a piece and they were put together. And I like that collaborative sense in doing them. I like the sense of making the object. And I want each object to feel as if it's complete. But I also want them to go together in a way that, you know, the parts are greater than, you know, the whole is greater than the parts of each one when you put them together. If that makes sure, sense. Which is, yeah, and you were talking about, how, you know, back 20 years ago, you were making puzzle pieces. Yep. Yes. So it kind of it continues in a way, right? I think you always, I always, at least I can't speak for everybody, kind of repeat myself in a fresher, newer, different way. I think that if you were to go back to even my graduate show at Northern and really analyze the pieces and looked at what I'm doing in 2020, there are things there, ideas there that, have been coming around for decades. Mm -hmm. You know, we are inherently who we are and we work that way. And I think the truest change are these little changes we make to enhance what we're working on. 
instead of the, I see this new work and I'm going to make this work. So this exhibition um, basically celebrates your nearly 30 years at Harvard, yeah. a long, um, wonderful career here, and your and really your first full year of retirement, right? You've been retired now one year, as we talked about, you've um, been quarantined for much of that. So as we can see in the gallery and, and in your studio as well, it's been a very prolific year for you. You've, you've made a lot of work and a really tight body of work um, and really been exploring and we're getting, we're getting to see it. Um, so I'm wondering what's, what's next? What comes after this great year? You know, that's, it's really interesting because um, I don't know if the artwork saved me or I saved the artwork. I was very curious when I retired. There was part of me that said, am I going to do clay again? Did I do clay because it was my job? Or is it kind of a passion for me to do it? And obviously, I love doing it. I love making this stuff. You know, there's, I consider myself a maker. So I finished this body of work. I delivered it to you. I went on vacation as much as you can. I went up to my trailer on the lake, um, chilled out, came home, and I'm drawing again, trying to figure out what the next ones are. Am I done with the totems? I don't know. Will the stuff on the wall look the same? I don't know. I've started drawing pieces that are coming more out of and off of the wall. Because for me, I, I like the idea of big work out of small parts. I know that comes out of having a smaller kiln in my urban studio setting. And mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see where it goes. The one thing I do know is it hasn't stopped. You know, I still want to do this. I have no idea what happened when we're off quarantine and we go back to what our new normal is going to be. Will I suddenly say, you know, I'm retired, I'll watch television? I don't think so. But Probably not. I hope that we just keep working and pushing it. Well, it's exciting to see. It's a really great body of work. It's a great exhibition. And thank you for doing it. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to do it. To do, actually, Jason, my first one-man show in what I call a really legitimate gallery space. So thank you. Well, I'm happy to be part of it, and uh, we're happy to have it here. So thank you for the interview, and all right, we'll see you soon. We'll talk later. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.